Colonel Gaddafi, revolutionary, dictator, paramilitary funder, and football fan. Labelled the Mad Dog of the Middle East by the geographically astute Ronald Reagan, Gaddafi was an international pariah during the 1980s. Well, we know that this Mad Dog of the Middle East has a, a goal of a world revolution, Muslim fundamentalist revolution. As trade restrictions were placed on Libya by the US and the UK, the revolutionary leader increased his anti-imperialist and anti-Western stance, a stance which saw him support paramilitary groups such as Hamas and the Provisional Irish Republican Army, which made it all the more controversial when a delegation of Irish footballers made the trip to Benghazi for a friendly against Libya's Al-Ali in 1989. Much to the confusion of the Libyans in attendance, it was not the Irish team of the 1988 Euros that arrived in their second city, but rather a mix of League of Ireland players made up from Bohemians and St. Patrick's Athletic. So how was it that a ragtag team of League of Ireland players made the trip to Colonel Gaddafi's Libya? The 1980s saw both Ireland and Libya go through extreme hardship. Ireland had been hit hard by the Thatcher recession, seeing a fall in living standards, a dramatic rise in unemployment, and an increase in emigration for the young workforce. All the while, the troubles raged on in the north as Republican and Loyalist paramilitary groups clashed over a three-decade conflict. And things in Libya weren't any better. Just over a decade into his reign as leader, Gaddafi began the 1980s by entering into a conflict with Ronald Reagan's USA. By the mid-80s, all US companies in Libya were ordered to cease operations by Reagan, and in 1986, following the 1986 Berlin discotheque bombings in which two US soldiers died, they began to escalate militarily. The US were aided in this by the United Kingdom, who blamed Gaddafi for the death of Yvonne Fletcher, the British policewoman shot and killed outside the Libyan embassy in London. And soon US airstrikes were hitting Libya, and Gaddafi's anti-imperialist and anti-Western stances were solidified. As odd as it may seem, Gaddafi wasn't exactly a stranger to Ireland and the Irish government at the time. When he first seized power in his 1969 coup, Gaddafi identified the provisional IRA as an ally in the fight against British imperialism. And in 1973, the first proven connection between the two was found, as the Irish Navy boarded a ship loaded with five tons of Libyan weaponry off the Irish coast. Following US airstrikes launched from UK military bases in 1986, Gaddafi said he resumed contact with the provisional IRA. In 1987, French authorities stopped a merchant vessel on the way to Ireland, loaded with 150 tons of Libyan arms, all destined for the IRA. Further ships were intercepted by the Irish Naval Service carrying arms, and it's estimated that Gaddafi sent around 1,000 AK-47s and 6 tons of Semtex explosives, alongside other arms, in just a couple of years. While this support of the provisional IRA strained relations with the Irish government initially, when Charlie Haw he was elected Taoiseach, he wasted no time in developing relations with Gaddafi, ensuring that the lucrative beef trade between the two countries would remain open in the face of Western sanctions. This export of 100,000 cattle drew the countries together, while creating much-needed jobs in Ireland and boosting the economy. While Ireland's economic fortunes began to improve, so too did the football. Well, on the international stage at least. The Irish national team qualified for their first European Championships in 1988, and their first World Cup in 1990 to cap off the decade. But despite the great success of the international team, and the booming popularity of the sport at home, football on the domestic level still suffered. As a semi-professional league, the majority of players were forced to work, alongside playing for their club. But things were so poor economically that some of the league's best players had to leave the country in search of better paying work, including the 1988 Player of the Year, Paddy Dillon, who left for Australia. Clubs were hugely reliant on gate receipts, which they only received from home fixtures every second week, leaving the survival of these clubs touch and go week on week. This meant that clubs had to be inventive to raise the funds that they desperately needed for survival. So in 1989, when representatives of the Libyan Football Association approached the League of Ireland about playing a match in Benghazi, there were plenty of interested parties. This turned out to be a lifesaver for St. Patrick's Athletic and Bohemians, who had both been eliminated from the first round of the FAI Cup, leaving them three weekends with no fixtures. And before they knew it, the Irish lads had set off for Gaddafi's Libya. He made sure to treat his guests well. The players were taken to his favourite restaurants and put up in a fancy hotel. But however nice the hotel was, it was situated outside of Benghazi, leaving the players isolated from the Libyan public. Despite this, they were also accompanied at all times by armed bodyguards, hardly the most familiar of situations for a League of Ireland footballer. Yet it didn't take long for them to cause trouble. With Libyan life dictated by the Quran, the familiar sights of pubs and betting shops were nowhere to be found for the players. So when the players were invited by expats to what they considered a bar within their living quarters, they jumped at the opportunity, and out into the Libyan desert they headed. When they got to this expat compound, they found an empty apartment, 
which the expats had been renting and repurposed as an Irish bar. Amongst the medical gear they had brought over, the Irish players had managed to bring spirits, which they enjoyed alongside the bar's homebrew. But then, as the Irish players were heading back to the hotel, they were pulled over by the Libyan police. Needless to say, they were far from happy when they smelled the alcohol in the vehicle. The eventful night was capped off by a short stint in a Libyan holding cell, before Brian Kerr was able to negotiate the players' release. With trouble behind them, and the Irish players set straight, all eyes were now on the game ahead of them. The match, as you'd expect, was quite the spectacle. The reported attendance figures are conflicting, but in the ground there was anywhere between 50 to 80,000 spectators, all hoping to catch a glimpse of what they thought was the Irish national team. Yet before the match could start, there was a sort of political rally, with a procession of people holding photos of Gaddafi in various forms of propaganda, acknowledging the people who had fought and been injured in Libya's name. This procession went on for hours, as the Irish players waited in the changing rooms at first, and then ventured onto the pitch for the warm-up, which lasted at least an hour as they waited for Gaddafi himself to arrive. When Gaddafi did arrive, it was on a white horse, and he was met with a standing ovation by the tens of thousands of onlookers. With Gaddafi seated at last, the match could finally go ahead. The pitch was half grass and half green carpet, held together by sticky tape, rough even by League of Ireland standards. But the match was an entertaining one by all accounts nonetheless. Al Ali's front men gave the Irish backline plenty of work to do, and early in the second half they took the lead with a great header to the obvious delight of those in attendance. When the Irish team replied just a few minutes later, it's safe to say the atmosphere was less than joyous. Even for the Irish team, celebrations were subdued, not wanting to over-celebrate in front of a dictator. But much to the relief of the Irish side, the match ended one all. And with the match over, the Irish lads were keen to head home, yet there was one more problem before they could depart. While the players were in a rush to get to the airport, they were still yet to receive payment for the match. Then at the hotel, a Libyan official arrived with the money, in Libyan dinar, a useless currency to the Irish. This caused a scene as the Irish officials rushed alongside the Libyans to the bank and insisted on payment in either pounds or dollars. Ultimately, they managed to sort it and the players were able to return home, bringing an end to the Libyan adventure. And just like that, over the course of a few days, a group of League of Ireland players took part in one of the strangest events in league history. The controversial trip born out of a lucrative beef trade and one revolutionary dictator's love of football, although much criticised at the time, would go relatively unknown until the 2019 documentary on RTE. Some have claimed that this relationship with Gaddafi and the trip that came with it prolonged the violence in the north. Others have said that it legitimised the Gaddafi regime. But for the players involved, it simply put food on the table at a time when the league couldn't. And of course, it gave them one hell of a story. Needless to say, however, for both Pats and Bowes players, the cup was taken a lot more seriously after that.